You're gonna try not to fall off the stage. I normally walk around when I talk. I'm a, I'm a teacher, and so I talk with my hands, and I walk around the classroom to at least keep my students' eyes focused a little bit up here. So let me know if I'm going too close to the edge and you'll see it. Uh, my name is Rebecca Napolitano. I am one of the session chairs for this with Mike and Dominique, and I'm a PhD candidate at Princeton University. I work in the Heritage Structures Lab, which is a brand new program that we're trying to build at Princeton. We're housed within the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, but we collaborate largely with our colleagues in the Department of Art and Archaeology, the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton, as well as the Department of Computer Science at Princeton. So the projects that we do are inherently multidisciplinary, so we like to make sure that we are an inherently multidisciplinary team trying to tackle those problems. And the talk that I'd like to share with you today, uh, it actually came entirely out of last year's CAA talks. So Mike gave a presentation on the baptistry, and he was talking about the foundations and how he wishes he could do a more rigorous numerical model, and I was like, I do that. I, I would love to help out. Uh, and so that's where this project came out of. So the talk is Numerical Methods for Understanding Crack Propagation and Complex Masonry Constructions. So one of the questions that I focus on in my work is how can we understand how existing damages occurred in order to better preserve historic structures. How many of you have seen a pristine historic structure which doesn't have any cracks in it? Or doesn't have any kinds of damage in it? It would be a wonderful anomaly to study as an engineering project, so if you do ever find one, please let me know. Uh, but what I like to do and what, what we need to do is try and understand how cracks occurred and how other damages occurred on these buildings so that way we can better preserve them. Uh, a lot of the time people just throw in tension rings or tie bars to buildings because they think that there's a crack that's growing. Uh, and what I like to do is try and really understand why have cracks evolved in our structure, how bad are these cracks for our structure, uh, in order to preserve these very vulnerable structures. There have been many case studies where some engineers have come along and put some, I think they were column drums uh, on one of the temples in Greece that they put these clamps on and the material didn't even end up being uh, compatible and it broke part of the structure. Uh, so we would have been better off if there was never any intervention by engineers. And so I really like to make sure that I'm coming at it from the side of archaeology and engineering so that way we don't have those issues in preservation. And so we can make very informed decisions. So as Mike already pointed out, the structure I'm going to talk to you about today is that baptistry in Florence. And so Mike did all the capturing of the geometry and all the uh, thermal imaging that he showed you already to get the background information that we needed to in order to develop our numerical model. So he captured the geometry. And during the capturing of the geometry, Mike was able to find some damages that he thought were alarming per se. So there's this one crack here. What you're seeing is the base of the baptistry is an octagon. And so this is one of the foundation walls from one side of that octagon. And there's this really large crack that runs the length of the foundation wall. It's a continuous crack. And there's some, there's some smaller spider cracking happening outside of it. But this is the one that's pretty alarming when you just see a crack going entirely through the wall that you're looking at and you know that there's this gigantic building standing on top of it, and you're like, how did this get here, and how bad is it? Uh, and so that's kind of where I come into play in this project. So before, before we can understand how these cracks kind of came into play, we need to understand what previous people have done for figuring out what kinds of loads could be incident on this structure. And so Mike actually recently had a paper where he talked about how the foundations of this structure predate the baptistry entirely. They were never meant to be the foundation walls of this really large superstructure. And so one of my questions was, okay, is that a load that's causing this cracking? Is it just that this wall was never meant to take such a large load coming down upon it? And so it was a one-time crack and there's not going to be any further issues. Uh, another question that we had looking at some of the literature that people have done looking at this building is looking at where these foundations sit in terms of the soil. So the foundations don't terminate in bedrock, they terminate in a sandy and silty gravel. 
And so we wanted to understand if maybe it was some kind of settlement that the wall was slipping on one side more than it was on the other in order to cause the cracking that we were seeing. Uh, and the last question is that earthquakes have been recorded in the area. Lots of earthquakes in Italy. Uh, and so we wanted to understand if it was maybe the load of an earthquake that could have caused the cracking. Engineering for real structures is never as it is in your experimental lab, though, so it's not just going to be an earthquake or settlement or a load. And so we also had to then consider, okay, if these are our basic loads that we could have on our structure, what would have happened if you put all of these happening into the structure? What would the cracks look like at that point? So this was the, uh, these little loading conditions we considered. So at my talk last year, I talked about this method, distinct element modeling, and this year I'm doing a slight variation on it. It's called finite distinct element modeling. I don't know if any of you know about distinct element modeling, but what you do is in finite, if I was going to model this room, I would model the walls and I would mesh them and I would put loads on them. In distinct element modeling, if this was if we could see bricks or stones in the wall here, I would model each individual brick or each individual stone. Well, I don't, Mike did. He was very patient and had. Um, but I would model each individual brick or stone. And then during my simulations, I can see what the separate, physical separation is of those blocks. In linear finite, you don't always, you can't see the separation of those blocks. And so the advantage of distinct is that they can completely detach from one another and you can start to see where cracks are evolving. This is a very complex and computationally heavy numerical method, so it's not applicable for everything, but we were specifically looking for cracks. So this was our method. Also, it's accessible. I had a free license, so that never hurts. So what Mike did was he took the laser scan data and he converted it into a 3D CAD model for us of the wall, modeling exactly where all of the stones were located. Uh, and then what I did was I used the methodology I presented at last year's CA and converted that CAD model into something that was readable by a finite distinct element modeling program. Uh, we had to mesh the mortar sections in here, and then each of these is a distinct block. And so the first load that we considered, going back to the loads that we said are most probable for our structure, is that we have just the dead load of the building acting on this foundation wall here. And so this is our wall. We have part of the building goes directly on top of the wall itself, and so we treated that as a distributed mode. But then there's also a column that acts on top of this foundation wall too, transmitting one eighth of the uh, roof structure. And so we had to consider a point mode there. Uh, additionally, we considered our earthquakes, and we considered settlement. And so what I mean in terms of settlement is that we I don't mean to go back, uh, is that we have our ground level here, and we just moved the base of our structure for, uh, we looked at right and left settlement based on engineering intuition and trying to understand how the cracks developed, but then we also changed it for a variety of different magnitudes so that way we could see how big of a problem it might have been. But then, as I was saying, we had to consider the combinations of all of these different kinds of loading acting together. The other thing that was interesting to, oh, there's a spoiler, keep clicking that instead of the laser scan, uh, laser pointer, is that this joint, we were interested in understanding, it's really, reg it's, it's roughly regular. I mean, is there a possibility that this was one wall and this was another wall and these were never stuck together, that if they started out as a construction joint and there was never any cohesion or joint tensile strength between those blocks there and so that's why it's a crack. Um, and so we then added that to the kinds of simulations we were doing under dead load and under uh, all the different versions of earthquakes because we wanted to try and be as thorough as possible because there are a lot of different combinations that could have led to this crack. So normally, and this is what I used last year, what you get out of distinct helmet modeling is this pretty rainbow plot of displacement magnitudes. And so what they mean is just that the red blocks here moved the most and the blue blocks here didn't move at all. And so Normally, when you're comparing two distinct element modeling simulations, you use these plots and you can kind of qualitatively assess. So under my settlement here, because my left side is further down, I have movement of my left side, which makes sense. But when I don't have any settlement here, I don't have as much movement, but I do still see some kinds of displacement occurring. 
this wasn't going to help us. We're looking for cracks. And so if we were doing this, we'd have to try to say, well, I guess this moves a little bit more than this, so maybe they separate, so maybe a crack's forming there. But that uh, qualitative business wasn't going to get us very far. Some people also would just take this and reduce it down to, so the average displacement of this whole wall is this, and the average displacement of this whole wall is this, and then try and compare those, which also wasn't what we were looking for. And so what we needed to figure out is a way of generating comparable results that were going to get us something in terms of where cracks could be forming under all these different loads. Again, for the end goal of understanding what happened to the structure and how can we best preserve it. And so what we did is we wrote the code that would it generate the contact points on all of the blocks. Uh, and then before you start any kind of simulation, it just calculates what the distance is between those two blocks to start out with. Then after you're in your simulation, you recalculate the separation between those same contacts that are adjacent to each other. And then if your displacement is larger than some input threshold, so here we put larger than a millimeter to kind of reduce out some of the noise, uh, you can plot it. If it's not, it doesn't plot, etc. And so this is one of the plots then that we were able to get out using this method of trying to uh, physically measure where the cracks were forming in our structure. So I didn't put up all 30 tiles because I think that would have been, you wouldn't have gotten anything out of it. Uh, so I just picked a couple of my favorites. Uh, we have just the gravity load here, two of the settlement cases and the earthquake loads. And you're able to see that under all of these different loading conditions, we are seeing different loading, uh, different cracking patterns that are occurring. Um, and it's important because if it's an earthquake load, then you know it's not something that's continuously happening. It's something that already happened, and then you can fix it. But if it's settlement, you're going to have to address that differently in preservation plans. So now that we had these, we had to figure out a way to actually compare them directly to each other. So what we did is we picked a sufficient number of points on our structure to compare. This is just a random array of points here. Uh, we calculated the crack size at each of those selected points for some of the simulations. And so some of them are going to be zero, but that's good because if you see on your earthquake model that you have five centimeters of separation, but on your real wall you don't see any separation there, then you know that you are not looking at a simulation that's feasible for your situation. Uh, find your crack sizes on your existing structure, compare the ones in your existing structure and in your simulations, and then select the simulation which most closely reflects the existing damage in terms of the locations and the magnitudes. So when we did that, looking at the larger matrix of the 30 different simulations, we were able to see that it was settlement of that left-hand side that was causing this crack pattern. And this did end up lining up with what Mike had done originally for a very qualitative initial estimate of what was happening in the, what was happening in the Baptist Street floor. So when you were asking how good is it, uh, Renato, when you asked how good is it if you're just comparing the pointer, he, he was onto something. This is the wall that we were looking at. And so what you're seeing here is this black region is much larger settlement than the blue region over here. So we are seeing that reflected in our more qualitative analysis. But we weren't getting as detailed information as we could out of the finite distinct. What Mike was alluding to uh, was that we also wanted to understand, did Mike have to spend all that time making that really complex 3D model, measuring out where all of the blocks were? Uh, in order to get these results. And so we took these three geometries. This is the geometry of the wall as it stands now. This is an idealized geometry. And this one, what happened is we just took out this continuous crack, wasn't there anymore. We moved some blocks around in order to not have that be present. And what we saw was that the crack simu uh, the simulations, should I grab the right one? Yeah, the existing, the cracked, and the change, and the ideal. Across the same loading conditions, you are seeing completely different results. In your one where you assumed that the crack was occurring, you're obviously seeing more cracking there than we were having on our existing structure. Uh, on the existing structure versus the ideal, you're not seeing that same crack forming. Uh, and when we compared, these were harder to compare, the change in the existing. When we compared them directly, we were able to see that the existing wall did more closely relate to what we were seeing in our existing damages, as opposed to the ones that were slightly altered or idealized. So it does matter that you do need this detailed information coming from the laser scanners and the photogrammetry in order to have an numerical model that can give you these very fine and accurate results for preservation plans. So Mike had this data, we did this, 
I like to test things on very small scales before I ever say that this is definitive and wonderful and correct. And so now what I'm doing is kind of doing it in reverse. I built a bunch of walls uh, in one of the basement labs back at Princeton and I had a lot of fun breaking them in different ways and coming up with craft patterns. And so now what I'm doing is doing this process I did for the baptistry, but for all of these test walls. And I either see if we got really lucky on the baptistry, which I'm hoping not because that was a lot of time, uh, or if this method is something that could be applicable for preservation plans. So I'm going to use the same method on those. Uh, this is a quote that I always like to end my numerical simulations talks with. All models are wrong, but some are useful. It's a nice little caveat to say don't come after me too hard in the questions for how accurate is this. Um, but I do think it's an important point. They're not, they're not religious texts. It's not telling you exactly what's happening, but it can give you some better intuition when you're looking at this very complex structure and trying to understand what could have caused these crafting patterns. It just gives you a little bit more in terms of trying to make a detailed preservation plan. So a lot of people I'd like to thank for this, uh, and thank you very much for your time, and I'd be happy to take questions.